Hello there. It's nice to have you all here. Today we want to examine a topic that teachers are very familiar with, which is differentiated instruction. But we want to take a look at implementing this differentiated instruction to meet the needs of certain learners. And for the purpose of this seminar, we'll be looking at just four types of learners. These are the gifted, the visually impaired, the hyperactive children, and the low ability learners. Before we go on, we'd like to look at the objectives of this seminar. Okay, one, by the end of the seminar, we should be able to recognize that students are different and respond differently to learning. We'll be able to identify the areas to differentiate. We'll be able to tailor our instructions to meet individual learning needs of these different students. And we're able to maximize each student's growth and success. Now I want to dive into the meaning of differentiated instruction. I have various definitions here that I'll be looking at. The first one is differentiated instruction is a philosophy for teaching that involves providing all students within a diverse classroom community of learners with a range of different avenues for understanding new information. Okay, so this one is saying in a class, you have various, you know, um, types of learners and you want to employ different avenues to reach out to them or to help them understand new information that you are passing across. Another definition says a process to approach teaching and learning for students of differing abilities in the same classroom. Okay, so in our classrooms, we have students of differing abilities, and we want to approach teaching and learning in different ways. And then the ability of a teacher to recognize students' varying background knowledge, their varying readiness, varying language, preference in learning, interest, and a re and react responsively. This is saying when teachers recognize that students have varying background knowledge, they have varying readiness, varying language, varying preferences in learning, varying interests, then you react responsibly, responsively to this. You respond to these various, to these differences in different ways. So I want us to actually focus on Carol and Tomlinson's definition. She's a noted differentiation expert. Okay, so in her video, in a video titled Creating Multiple Paths for Learning, she defined differentiated instruction as this. Differentiating instruction means that the teacher anticipates the differences in students' readiness interest and learning profiles, and as a result, create different learning paths so that students have the opportunity to learn as much as they can, as deeply as they can, without undue anxiety because the assignments are too taxing or boredom because they are not challenging enough. Now, I want us to take a look at this picture as a teacher, I have these three students and I've given each of them a box to stand on. Have I been fair? Yes, I've been fair. Oh, well, that is what most people will say that I've been fair. But if you look at these three people, you would see that not all of them need the box to be able to see what's happening across the fence. Okay, so let's look at another picture. A look at this second picture. Now I have taken the box from the tall um, student and given it to the one who needs it the most. If you look at the second picture, everyone is happy and everyone can see what's happening across the fence. So this will take me to Rick Wamele's famous saying that fair doesn't always mean equal. So I want to be fair to these three students. Being fair to them doesn't mean I have to give each of them a box. 
So being fair to them doesn't mean I have to treat them equally, okay? So this brings me to fair, the meaning of fair in this sense or in differentiated instruction, fair isn't everyone getting the same thing. Fair is everyone getting what they need in order to be successful. Now I'm bringing this home as educators, we must recognize that all of our students bring different gifts and challenges. Thus, we need to recognize those differences and use our professional judgment to flexibly respond to them in our teaching by tailoring instruction to meet individual needs. Now, why do we need to employ differentiation or why should we differentiate instruction? I have a few reasons here. The first one is to excite the brilliant students to uncover deeper layers of learning. We have some um, um, ex, ex, um, ex, extremely brilliant students in our class classes and we do not want to bore them with basics. So we want to help them uncover deeper layers of learning. So this is why differentiated instruction must come to play. Then we want to give the low ability students the support that they need. We also want to maximize the growth of every student by meeting them where they are. We want to support students with learning disabilities, disabilities like, um, um, sorry, disabilities like dyslexia, disabilities like dyscalculia. So you want to support such students. And this is why differentiated instruction must come in. Now, you also employ differentiated instruction to enable each student enjoy a successful learning experience. And finally, to ensure every student within the classroom learns effectively, regardless of differences and ability. Okay, now what are the areas to differentiate or areas of differentiation? According to Tom Linson again, there are four areas of differentiation. And the first one is content. That is what is to be learned. What you want to learn should be differentiated. The content of the lesson should be different. That should be differentiated. The second thing is the process. How students are going to acquire the information. You want to go through different path, different paths to meet with different learner needs. So you're going to be teaching it in different ways, even though it's in one lesson. And then the third one is the product, how students demonstrate their learning. So how learning is observed, you want to observe how each child or each student is demonstrating the learning that has taken place. And finally, where and with whom students learn. This is how the classroom atmosphere, you want to look at the way the classroom works and feels. So these are the four areas of differentiation. Now I want to go into the crux of the matter. How would you implement different instructions to meet the learning needs of the following learners? I told us we'll be looking at just four um, types of learners and these are the gifted, the visually impaired, the hyperactive children and the low ability learners. Let's go straight to the gifted. The National Association for Gifted Children defined the gifted this way. A gifted student gives evidence of high achievement capability in areas such as intellectual, creative, artistic, or leadership capacity with a need for services and activities not ordinarily provided by the school in order to fully develop these or those capabilities. For example, in our school, Nigerian Tulip International Colleges, we actually have a plan for such gifted students. This is not the normal, um, you know, the ordinary activities or services that we render to all students. So we need to bring them out because they are gifted um, and, or they have displayed this giftedness. So we bring them out to nurture their potentials. How do you identify the gifted? Okay, they are not always high achievers because they always um, aim for perfection. 
So this doesn't mean they don't achieve um, high grades or high scores, but most of the time they're always gunning for perfection and this makes them you know, slow in finishing their work sometimes or in, you know, <laughs> they don't give you the normal or regular responses that you need. Then they may act out because they are bored. If you feed them with the basics, like, you know, just give them the normal things you're giving to the entire class, they will get bored. And at the end of the day, they may not learn anything. They may already know what you're even um, teaching for the day. So you need to plan something else for them. Okay, like I said earlier, they may not finish their work because they are get, gone in for perfection. They're always looking, working towards perfection. They feel the work is not perfect enough. They want to polish it, they want to perfect it. And then this causes them to delay. Then they may test poorly because they overthink things. Now you ask them a question, you may not expect to get a regular response because they think outside the box and then they overthink things and give you answers that may not be the response that you have for a test or an assessment. So now we want to look at teaching strategies that you may uh, teachers can employ for such students. You have to, the first one is employ higher order thinking skills. Higher order thinking skills should be employed. You make them analyze. You make them, you know, create things, creativity. You want to encourage them to dive deeper into concepts. You want to look beyond the surface level of concepts, ask them to dig deeper. You also want to encourage them to become experts on a topic. They can go the extra mile by reading up um, more on a topic. Then you use these higher order thinking skills in their assessments. For example, you give them open-ended questions and tiered activities. We'll be looking more into tiered activities later. Another strategy is anchoring activities. Normally, these students may finish their work earlier than others. So you must go to class with extra activities or anchoring activities or backup activities, as you may want to call it. And these include puzzles, games, games such as word search, you may use the words in class to, the words you, 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 you plan to teach for the day to create a word search, and then you give it to them when they are done with their task. You can also give them extra activities. For instance, if I teach nouns, and I ask the students to circle the nouns in sentences that I have given in a worksheet, I can ask these gifted students to give me extra, um, one, you know, extra sentences with those words. Apart from the sentences I've given, once they are done, they can give me sentences using those words they have circled. Can also ask them to do some kind of research, extra research on topic. Other activities that will encourage critical thinking skills should be used for these students. Then accelerating and decelerating. With the gifted students, you may want to check pacing. With them, you may be tempted to accelerate your lesson, for, but then you have other students that need you to slow down. So the, you know, providing anchor activities can also help you to decelerate when you need to, and, and then accelerate when you need to. So it allows the gifted to work at their own pace. When you give them this extra activity, you'll be able to concentrate or allow the other students to work at their own pace and also encourage these gifted students to work at their own pace. Another strategy is collaboration. In class, you can group the gifted students together to do a task when you want them to do some tasks. And then here you bring in the difficulty level of their own task will be different. This will help them to challenge themselves and challenge one another. It will also help them to boost academic ach achievement. And at the end of the day, it benefits other students, especially where they have to present what they have come up with. This will be to the benefit of other students in the class. Another strategy is tiered lesson, which I talked about earlier. Okay, 
Here, this involves planning lessons at different years of difficulty. You can plan your worksheets with different difficulty levels for different sets of students, giving the higher difficulty level to the gifted students. Then deep and complex activities may be planned for them as well. Another strategy is their assessment. These gifted students may require a more individualized approach to assessment. So here, they may, you may want to ask them to come up with their own rubrics. Maybe you want them to write an essay You can or, or read. You can ask them to come up with their rubrics for assessment. When they finish writing, ask them to come up with their rubrics. They can also set goals for themselves. Okay, now we go to the second group of students. These are the visually impaired or partially blind. Okay, the definition I have here of visual impairment is visual impairment can be defined as a range of visual losses that require adaptations for learning in a variety of environments, according to Silberman and Sowell. Okay, how do we identify the visually impaired? They are affected by different visual problems. They may, have, they may be far-sighted, they may be um, short-sighted. Then they may have low eyesight, maybe they can't see very clearly. Then they may have problems seeing in certain areas of their visions. Then they may have peripheral, they may have no peripheral visions. Okay, some students cannot see anything on the, by, their, by the side, they cannot see, they can only see what is right ahead of them. So what is the first thing a teacher should do here? The first thing you should do is find out what type of impairment the child is suffering from. This will help you inform your decisions as to how to cater for the child's needs. We want to look at some strategies, seat assignment. Okay, you may need to sit a child near the board in a central location, central with other students surrounding him or her so that the child does not feel isolated. And if it's a child that sees the board better from behind, you may need to sit the child behind. Secondly, you need to verbalize as you write on the board. Please let's not confuse this to mean we should back the children while talking to them. We know that is a bad teaching habit. I have pictures here of teachers who are writing and then you turn and talk to the children. So try to verbalize whatever you write on the board. This is quite helpful. And you can also provide a handout of key terms in large print or audio recordings for such students. Okay, another thing we can do is to consider lighting conditions. Sometimes the student, too much lighting may affect a child. Sometimes less lighting may affect a child. So we need to be to find this out and be very careful whether we need to place them close to a window or not. And then when we use um, devices such as interactive boards or transparencies projectors, we may need to dim the light in the room to have more contrast, to be able to see the screen more clearly. Another strategy is the use of 3D objects. So for such students, sensory, other sensory organs may be sharper than their sight. So you want to use 3D objects to enable them to touch these objects, interact with the object for better understanding. So you can include lots of hands-on activities in your class. Then allow opportunities for repetition and practice of previously introduced material. You try to always go back to what you have um, taught before, review it with the students and practice with them before you go to a new material. Assessment can also be orally done for such students. Oral, they can take oral exams if they are more comfortable with this. Then, we may also give them projects and then presentations rather than ask them to write a test. Then visually, 
demanding activities should be followed by periods requiring less strain on the eyes. Maybe they have just watched a video. You turn that off and then do something different that will not strain their eyes. Maybe hands-on activities can follow. Now the third set of students are the hyperactive students. Okay, I have a definition here. Hyperactivity is the most obvious sign of ADHD. ADHD is a learning disability or learning disorder, which means attention deficit, deficit hyperactivity disorder. So this hyperactivity is the most obvious sign of students with ADHD, as well as inattention and impulsivity in class. They just do things on impulse. So children who are hyperactive exhibit symptoms of attention deficit disorder like wanting to jump around. How do we identify them? Let's see. They are fidgety, restless, easily bored. You know, they, they just cannot stay still for a long time. Then they try to do several things at once. They also exhibit inattention and impulsivity. They, they do not pay attention regularly and they do things on impulse. They have trouble sitting still or staying quiet when needed. They like to bounce around from one activity to the next. And both their bodies and their brains also have trouble slowing down. So it's not only their body that, is, that they find difficult to keep still, their brains are also <laughs> as active. We want to look at teaching strategies that you can employ for such students. First, adapting the environment. So this can really help hyperactive students to focus and it can help them sustain their attention. What do you do? You can bring them to the front seat so that they will be very they will be close to you. You can also place them close to a well-behaved student who is who is very attentive in class. That person can help check them at all times. Another strategy is written instruction. After giving a general instruction in class, teachers need to give written instruction to such children. So there's a need to give simple and direct instructions, not complex instructions to explain a task. And then also it would be nice to write down this um, instruction and give it to this restless child. Okay, then remodeling instruction. After you have given this instruction, you should model it, remodel it again for the sake of the restless students. So there should be lots and lots of examples for them, lots and lots of demonstration and lots of modeling. So you model what you want them to do. Another strategy is to chunk tasks. Don't give them too many things to do at the same time. Try to give them in chunks, in bits. And then you can give, you can ask them to check, um, you can give them a checklist, which they will tick off as they finish each task. This can keep them busy for a while. Another thing we need to do for the hyperactive students is to ensure they get a pass before they leave their seat. So make sure you have a pass. When you want to leave their seat, they must take a pass before they leave. They cannot leave their seats without a pass. And then because we know that they cannot sit still for very long, you can go, you know, you can allow them to take a walk, to take a drink of water during your lesson. That way you'll be feeding they are restlessness in a very productive way. Another strategy is to give them traveling assignments. How do we give traveling assignments? You place worksheets in different um, places in the class. You can give them three or four worksheets, but you place them in different um, positions of the classroom. So when they finish with one worksheet, they move to another uh, position in the classroom to finish another worksheet. And then they move to the third 
position to finish another worksheet. So that's a traveling assignment. That way they are not stuck in their seats and they are also meeting their needs. Then we can adopt the rewards or token system. You can have tokens that you give to them and then you let them know after you have received so, num so, so, so number of tokens, you get a reward. So in a day on, or in a lesson, you can earmark five tokens. If you're able to stay still and finish this task, task in so, so, so time, you get a token. Or if you're able to do this, you get a token. And if you're able to get five tokens in my lesson, you get a reward. So when we try, when we um, adopt these systems, it can also help the students to stay on task. And finally, the use of computers. You can make them use the computer to complete their own task rather than write, um, writing. So the use of computers can keep them focused and can keep them for a longer time on that task. So we can employ the use of computers. Now we get, we're going to go to the last group of learners. These are the low ability learners. The low ability learners are those considered to have a limit to what can be achieved with them. They are said to have a limit beyond which further effort from the teacher is wasted. These people have a limit. Once they get to that limit, whatever you're teaching is a waste of time. They, they have already, they are, they, their limit is already full. The capacity they can take is already full and they cannot go beyond that. The academic capability of a student generally dictates the pace at which he or she can learn. And for low ability learners, this capability is limited. Now, how do you identify them? They are slow paced learners. They have a limit to what they can achieve per time. And no means an indicator. Okay, this is by no means an indicator for future failings. It doesn't mean because they are slow paced learners, then they will, they will be failures. We shouldn't have um, that kind of mindset. Now, note. We must find out why they are not meeting outcomes that they are expected to. Maybe at the age of eight in, a, in a primary four or three, they are meant to be able to meet certain outcomes. If they are not able to meet these outcomes, you should find out why. So you take out time to find out why. This will also help inform your decision to meet, to cater for their needs. Now, what are the teaching strategies we can employ to help such students? Number one, change your view. Low ability is a fixed view. As teachers, we must not have this mindset that a low ability student is a failure. We must strike that out of our minds. It's a fixed view. And it is, uh, it is not right for teachers to now stamp that on the child. Reaching their goals, they take different routes at the end of the day it's for the student to reach their goal. The, for these students, they may be, the, their pace may be slower, but at the end of the day, you want to you know, encourage them to meet their goals. So we must change our view. We must change our mindset. That's the first thing we must do. Secondly, teachers should set high expectations. They should have high expectations of what they, are, what they can achieve in a lesson and plan accordingly. Now have high expectations for these students. Ask them to wipe out of their minds that they can't do something. Set high expectations for them. And this, you know, at the end of the day, when they achieve it, whether they are right or wrong, just encourage them, celebrate them, and let them feel good that they were able to complete the task that you gave to them. So set high expectations for them. This will lead us to praising their effort. Low ability students should be praised. When you ask them to do something or ask them to complete a task and they're able to praise their effort, don't praise their achievement as in whether they, they passed everything or they, you know, they got a high score. Don't praise their score, 
praise their efforts that they were able to complete the task. You should, you know, encourage them. You should praise them. So whether, irrespective of whether they are right or they are wrong, before you even check the, the, the work to see if they were right or wrong, try to encourage them by praising them. Then for low ability learners, we should use hinge questions. What are hinge questions? These are questions that we throw to the students just to confirm that they, are, they, they have clearly understood what we, a prerequisite or something we have taught them that the next topic is going to be hanging upon. So you have taught them um, adjectives, for example, and you now want to teach them adjective phrase or adjectival phrase. Now you have to throw hinge questions to find out if they have understood adjectives before you now move into adjective phrases. So use hinge questions, then do not assume that they, they, know, they know things or they have understood your instruction. Model it, please always model instruction, model what you want them to do, explain it, model it, and then before you allow them to do it, then use sentence starters. For example, if they are going to write an essay, you can give them sentence starters. You can give them a pool of words to use, and then this will help them to, to you know, feel freer to express themselves because they have a bank full of words that they can pick from, or they have sentence starters. We have sentence starters for additional ideas. We have sentence starters to show time and order. We have sentence starters to show examples and so on. So you can give them these sentence starters and encourage them to use it. So you just, this is like um, supporting them to a level and then leaving them alone to continue with the task then provide feedback. It's very important to provide feedback all the time and you should make your feedback purposeful and formative, okay? The feedback should be something that should be, can be built upon. So when they have made good progress, let them know it. Let them know they have made good progress. That brings us to the end of those four types of learners and the teaching strategies we can employ to reach out to them. So in summary, we've been talking about using differentiated instruction as a pathway to reaching out to the different learners that we have in our classes. So differentiated instruction, instruction helps us to ensure that all students are presented an equal opportunity to learn. So nobody goes away feeling sad. The, the, Low ability learner doesn't feel, oh, the teacher was too fast or the pace was too fast for me and I didn't grasp anything. And the gifted will not feel the pace was too slow because you have anticipated these different learners and you have planned towards meeting them at their points, at their various points of need. Thank you very much for the time we have spent together. I hope as teachers, you begin to employ these different strategies in your classrooms and you make your children the happier for it. Thank you.